welcome everybody. We're so glad to have you all here with us today. My name is Sarah Brown and I'm the opinion coordinator at the Arizona Daily Star. And I am joined by the one and only David Fitzsimmons, editorial cartoonist at the Arizona Daily Star. And we have our special guest today, Dean Salmon. We're so happy to have you with us here today. And uh, we're gonna talk about everything going on in the skies. So Dean is a uh, Kitt Peak Observatory technician, but he's also an astronomy photographer and nature photographer. So we're gonna let Dean introduce himself a little further. We've also got a slideshow of some of his images. Um, but we'll give you his website and everything to check out some of his other work. It's amazing, by the way. But uh, Dean, thank you for being here and go ahead and introduce yourself a little bit to us. But if you guys have any questions along the way, feel free to raise your virtual hand or put some questions in the chat and Fitz or myself will make sure and keep an eye on those and we'll ask Dean. So take it away, Dean. All right, great. Um, how are you guys on doing? Uh, it's just right in the middle of a peak issue so hopefully the phone will not ring on me um, anyways um uh i've been in astronomy for since uh the early 70s actually and i've been doing photography about 50 years um i currently work at kit peak visitor center i'm the observatory technician there for it so i kind of take care of all the buildings and the domes and their network and websites and all the other stuff. Um, so uh, it keeps me quite busy. And I've been working with uh, McMath Solar Telescope lately for about the last three years, um, mainly operate, keeping it operational. Um, uh, and I'll tell you a little bit about what's happening with that. Um, let me uh, pull up my notepad so I put all this in advance move this to the other monitor and the solar telescope you just referenced is that one that's up on Kitt Peak that's the McMath uh, solar telescope McMath Pierce solar um, one thing I do want to tell you about is um, I'm going to put the Kitt Peak Visitor Center website here and Okay. And um, that's our visitors. Now, right now, currently, Kitt Peak is close to the public. That may change in the, that's going to change in the future, but I don't have any details about that. So just keep checking the website. And if I know anything and can really say anything, I'll update the website because I take care of that too. Um, but the um, Windows on the Universe here, which I'll send you a link to. Well, actually, if you go to that Kitt Peak Visitor Center website, right on the bottom, I just put that in the, today, there's a link to the Windows on the Universe, and it will tell you all about it. But basically what we're doing is since the beginning of 19, uh, 19, uh, 2018, uh, the Visitor Center was granted a grant to uh, redevelop the McMath Solar Telescope into um, a new, new exhibits. One of them will be called Science on a Sphere. And what that is, it's a six foot sphere with projectors being pushed against the, the wrap around the globe. And the data sets pretty much come from all over the world. They could be anything about ocean currents, astronomy, uh, how many airplanes are in the, how many planes are in the air. <laughs> quite a bit of, quite a bit of variety. Um, eventually Kit Peak will probably be contributing to those data sets as we do get open. And, um, and I, don't, I don't have any information about when that's going to open, but I know it's going to eventually. Um, again, you always check the website. And the McMath Solar Telescope is, is, um, was at one point the largest tel solar telescope in the world. It's a two meter heliostat, and there's two other 0.9 meter heliostats. So all together, there's three instruments there. And, um, it's, it's quite an it, and what we're going to do when we do open the exhibit is basically uh, the public will actually be able to view the sun, the moon, the planets with these telescopes. So um, lots to come of that. Um, okay, so um, she, she will give you my 
website. I do have an Instagram account. You can always search for great scenery and that will find it. Um, so, so I do see some questions and I'll get to them. I know about one person asked about the satellites being launched from uh, Starlink, I mean, space, SpaceX. Um, that is starting to cause some issues with the professionals. So not sure what they're gonna do with it because the satellites weren't gonna go away. <laughs> so, <laughs> but, so part of the things we're gonna be, do, some of the things that I'm involved with a little bit and what I've seen is remote viewing through a telescope. Uh, there's some advantages to that. First of all, so explain you, what that is first off, Dean, because remote viewing, like so remote what, what viewing is, is where you actually are looking from home or even another building in, say, the visitor center. Um, and you can actually see the objects that are viewed through the telescope. Now, there's a, a camera has much more clarity and definition. So um, you're gonna get a much clearer picture than what you would normally see through the eyepiece. Although looking through the eyepiece is an experience in itself. I've, I've seen people amazed on what they see with their eyes and they can't believe it. So um, first of all, let me respond to a quick text here because it's a simple fix. Um, so let me uh, do that real quick. It can't run without its technician. <laughs> Basically. Well, none of us can avoid, you know, workplace necessities, that's for sure. Okay, that's been fixed. Um, so anyways, uh, let me get into my other notes that I had here. And move this out of the way. Okay. Okay, so... So, it, so what Kit Peak, the other thing Kit Peak will do, will, I, I got changed subject here. Okay, back to the remote viewing. So basically what the remote viewing is, it would be a virtual star party, essentially looking through a telescope. And you could be at home or, or somewhere nearby. Now, one big advantage to this, if you think about it, is people living in the Southern hemisphere can't see the objects in the Northern hemisphere and vice versa. So they would be able to see things that normally cannot be seen over there because the earth gets in the way. <laughs> so, um, so that will be one advantage. Um, and also Arizona, if I remember right, is kind of a great place for remote viewing just because of our dry weather. Cause isn't that kind of a huge hindrance sometimes with uh, astronomy is all the rain and the humidity of some other places. So that's a good point. Um, Arizona has been, is a, is a fairly dry climate. We normally benefit from Southern California's climate pattern. Um, the other advantage is, um, but these observatories up high on the mountains, but getting above the, they're getting above the air a little bit. So the transparency and the clarity of the air is what they call atmospheric scene conditions is much better. Now, if someone posted something about light pollution and that's kind of getting to be a problem uh, more and more. Now Tucson has a lighting ordinance on it. So everything's what they call low sodium lighting. Now that can actually be filtered out with a filter. It's when you get the high sodium uh, lighting or, or mercury vapor, uh, mercury lights, then um, you're gonna, you, they're, it's much more difficult to do. So uh, right now KPEAK's handling it. <laughs> so <laughs> And, but other observatories, like for example, Mount Wilson was closed down in California because of Los Angeles. Now it's a public, it's a public access, the telescope, but the 100 inch, uh, mirror, the 100 inch telescope no longer does actual uh, viewing anymore for scientific. Um, so well, one of the main reasons they closed was because of light pollution? That is correct, yep. Wow, that's sad to hear. So going back to the McMath Solar Telescope, um, I should, I should, since someone made a comment about it, uh, a heliostat is pretty much a reflector, a reflector mirror on the top of the telescope tower. And all that does is the sun, 
So the way the telescope moves, it moves in from an east-west direction and there's a north-south axis movement. Now it is 1964 technology, so it's, it's interesting to run the telescope. And when people come inside and see the computer, which is a PDP-11, if you know what that is, that was, that's a long time ago. So the heliostats actually do nothing more than just reflect the light down the tunnel, which is about 500 feet. It's another mirror. It goes about, goes close to where the control room is and aims the mirror 45 degrees down to the observing table. So that's pretty much how that telescope works in a nutshell. And watching sunset on it, which is something windows on the ears will eventually do when they are open, is quite amazing. <laughs> I've seen not only the mountains, but I've seen 737 jet trails flying right by and could see the actual formation of the jet. So pretty wow. interesting. Um, let's see. I'm going to go on. So that's kind of where the other thing people do with te uh, telescopes is they actually rent time on the telescope and they'll take astronomical pictures. So for example, I mean, we have a picture of such an example. Can you slide the slide show? Um, two slides, I think it was, past the trails. We'll actually stop at the star trail, so I'll mention about that. Okay, you want me to go ahead and share that now? Sure. All righty. Okay, let me talk about this for, because it's actually easy to do. So people that have a simple DSLR camera that has a, um, an ability to keep the shutter open for what they call uh, longer than 30 seconds. Um, this picture was taken and what I did was I just put a tripod on there, put the camera on there with a very wide angle lens. And um, the camera can be set to a very low ISO so if, it, if you're familiar with DSLR images, there's an ISO setting that allows you to increase the sensitivity. You want to set this as low as possible. Most cameras default to 100. So then you, you aim the camera and you get things, take, get things focused and there's a way to, you can look into your camera manufacturing and see how that's focusing works. It's pretty simple. And then you take about a 20 minute exposure, which is what this is. And you'll actually see the stars rotating around like this and making this effect. And you can pick up the Milky Way, which you can see here. This was taken behind the McMath Solar Telescope, and it has to point north. So that was a pretty good spot to just sit there and do just that. Um, and you can take a series of these and combine them together. So it's it's so star trails are very easy to do. Uh, if you want to take something without trailing. You just need to set your exposure to like 20 seconds and set the ISO camera to its maximum, like 6,400 most or even higher, and shoot about a 20 second exposure because anything longer than that, you're gonna start seeing those star trails. And you've got to use a really wide angle lens, probably a 28 millimeter, 50 at the most. And I would put a foreground object like a saguaro cactus in front of it. And then you can take a flashlight, a, a, a dim light and paint the cactus. It's called light painting in photography. You can kind of paint the cactus and you get a pretty interesting picture. So. That sounds really cool. So that's, a, that's actually fairly easy to do. Now, the, you do want to get away from downtown Tucson because that's not gonna work. <laughs> so, but you only have to go about 30 minutes, 40 at the most, and you're pretty much out of the, enough out of the light to get away from it. Um, so what I was leading toward, you can go to the next picture, sir. What I was leaning to is the other thing that um, a lot of people are doing. Oh, well, let me introduce these two. Just to let you know, Jupiter and Saturn are at prime viewing observation. So if you can find a friend with a telescope or um, possibly go to a local planetarium, they may have a, you might look and see what they have there. Uh, you can actually see these planets. Um, Saturn still looks nice. The rings are starting to close. Saturn goes around the orbit every 29 years and every 14 and a half years, the rings become line of sight with Earth and they become what's called edged on and they kind of disappear for a while for 
yeah, a month or two. Um, so, but the rings are pretty nice right now. And I just looked at Saturn the other day, so it looked pretty good. Like what time of night is a good time to go out and view these? Okay, that's a good question. So you want to look in the southeast. Um, Jupiter should be up after, as soon as it gets dark. Saturn probably will be up about an hour later. And the const they are in the constellation of what's called Capricornus. Um, and uh, they're, they're pretty, they're the brightest things in the Southeast really to see. Um, this picture was actually taken at Kid Peak with a 0.9 meter when we were using it at, for a little while. And this is uh, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus and Neptune actually. And it was taken with a simple little webcam camera. So what you normally put on your computer so wow it's a so they're they're easy to capture and it was that they were videos actually and then the videos get compressed into a single image and this is how you create it so this picture of jupiter on the left hand side what is the bright star off to the right of it that's one of the moons oh that's one of its moons yeah, that's okay. one of the moons and i think it was io if i remember right correctly so and same with saturn the little yellow dots you see there those are actual moons and you can see Uranus and Neptune also have moons. Okay. So this is actually, this is on my website um, in the solar system section of my website. Which you all should check out. The photography on there is amazing. So, and you can get to that easily with greatscenery.com if you can remember. That's easy to remember, great scenery. So <laughs> that'll, get, that'll get you there. So um, what also is happening more and more around the world now, people are renting time on a telescope because they live in New York City where they can't see the sun practically because there's so much pollution, either pollution or date or night uh, light pollution. Um, so they they rent time on it and they take pictures like this. They're they're usually trained how to do that. Um, there's a lot of places in the world that are kind of doing this now. Um, there's one in Australia. So if you want to take pictures of the southern sky, this is the way to do it. Um, uh, again, so what are we looking at here? Okay, so in this particular case, and I actually took this um, for a guest at Kitt Peak. They wanted a nice picture of the Crab Nebula. This is the constellation Taurus. It's a planetary nebula. It's about 5,000 light years away. So light travels at 186 miles and 300 miles per second. Um, and in a year, it's about, almost about 5.8 trillion miles. So you're seeing it as it was 5,000 years ago. Uh, this supernova exploded and it, it was 1054 AD, I believe. And uh, it was quite, it was, and you could see the star during the daytime. That's how, how bright these things get to be. So. So when we see colors like this in astronomical photography, um, why is that? Is that what you would see in the sky or can you? So visual, visually, you're not going to see this because our eyes don't record. Or they don't, they're like video cameras take a fraction of a second. You forget what you saw. Cameras are continuously recording light. And what they do with the astrophotography, it's changed a little bit now, but what they used to do is they used to use something called a CCD cam camera, a charge coupling device. And what that did was it collected light through filters, a red, green, blue filter. And you put this together and it's, um, is it true color? Not quite, because we do go through an atmosphere and light does bend. So um, our yellow sun isn't really yellow, so um, so that so it's going to alter the. But in reality, this is a pretty picture, so it looks good. So <laughs> nobody's questioning that. Ironically, and it's kind of hard to see here. When I took this picture, a little tiny asteroid went by, and I looked up. You know, you can actually look up what asteroid that was, and it was. Um, it was discovered in 1998 and it was discovered by Space Watch on Kitt Peak. So that was kind of an interesting coincidence. It's a very, very tiny little line below and just to the left of the Crab Nebula. And you can see it on my website. So I don't see it here, um, but uh, it's a, 
it's a little itty bitty movie thing. They move all the way across, but I just captured one of the frames just to show it was there. Um, but this exposure, just to let you know, um, was about um, about three or four hours. So again, with a wider field of view telescope, and and there's lots, of, you know, there's lots of options, um, and you can capture things like this. It's called the North American Nebula and the Pelican Nebula. So I, I so it looks like North America, right? <laughs> yeah. So, uh, this is in the constellation Cygnus, uh, which is in the summertime. Now it's interesting. You can't see this visually with a telescope. Well, you can see very faint parts of it, like the right bright area around Mexico, but in reality, most of it's pretty much invisible uh, because it's just too much contrast background with this. I mean, there's. It blends into the background too well. This was taken with a hydrogen alpha filter because most of the most of the stuff in the galaxy is hydrogen alpha. That's about 80, 90% of it actually. So uh, that's why it captured it so well. So, and then you use a regular red, green, blue filter to add uh, color in the background for the color to, and the nibble itself. So again, this is like a three hour exposure. This stuff is faint. So, um, and it was taken with, it was actually taken with a telescope at Pitt Peak. So um, it, we have a small little FSQ 106 millimeter refractor and it's used for viewing as well. It's, it makes some pretty nice choice. That's the nice thing about Pitt Peak's telescope up there. They have the 20 inch up there and they have the uh, little refractor so you can switch back and forth. Um, let me divert just a little bit here, tell you about what the Kit Peak programs are about in case you're not aware of them. A lot of this information is on the website still, even though you can't get up, you, you know, it's closed, but the information is still there. But basically we have a public program, which is extremely popular. Um, it's, it, 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 has, it, had very, it has very high ratings overall. Basically, and you come up, uh, you, you have a meal, you, you, the way it was working before, it might change, but the way it was working before, you have, a, you have a meal, you watch the sunset, which is a very beautiful spot, and then you, you get an introduction to astronomy, and you go take an outside look at the constellations, you use the binoculars to help identify some things you can't see with your eyes, and then you go into the telescope for an hour or so, and you view through the telescope. Now, we also have programs that are dedicated for only telescope viewing because people don't want to just go outside and look at the constellation. They want to come and look at the telescope. So that's called the dark sky discovery program. There's a moon program and there's things like that. So once it comes back to life, it's going to be very, very, very popular uh, again. And, um, and then, then we have the overnight programming and people come up they spend the night there. They're usually in, they're in a cabin or a dorm. They get meals, and they are the operate. They are the astronomer of the telescope. We are nothing more than an operator. They tell us what to do, and we give them suggestions if they're a little lost. But um, most of the time, it's it's really um, it's kind of a nice family environment. So it's especially in the summer, it's a good way to get out of the heat. So so that's kind of what Kit Peaks about, and the website does talk about that all. And um, again, I don't have any details of when everything's gonna open up, but again, when I know, and I can let you know, I'll update the website. <laughs> so, um, let's see. I, wa I wanna talk about just a little bit here about um, the other half of my world is, is photography about nature. Um, I do a lot of nature photography. I, and if you want, bring up Sarah, you want to bring up some slides, that's fine. Yep. Um, basically, I focus on very small objects and close up objects. Um, and one thing, I don't, one thing I should have put here, one thing we should have put in here was a Milky Way shot, actually, but I didn't remember to do that. So, anyways, I've taken what with, again, let me just say it briefly. Like on my website, there's examples of this, and I you can take Milky Way shots of wide field camera. Now you're going to need a little tracker or something. There's a, there's a few options on the market. There, a couple hundred dollars maybe. And if you look up barnyard tracker, you can actually make something for about twenty thirty dollars. And it, it's a manual way of tracking the sky while you're taking a picture. 
Again, it's called barnyard uh, tracker. It's essentially two pieces of wood, a screw and a crank, and you put the camera on it and just you turn the handle every 60 seconds or whatever it takes. I forgot. <laughs> but anyways, you can get very rich pictures of the Milky Way. And one that got really popular in Kitt Peak is I was in front, I was in front of the big mass solar telescope and I got the Milky Way over that telescope. And it was nice of a meteor to show up as well. So it, it's kind of all over the place now. And, um, but anyways, so on the daytime side, I do, I've been doing a lot of nature photography about the last 10 years or so. I do photography like this. Uh, I get really close to my subjects. <laughs> um, and, um, it's kind of a funny story. I used to be afraid of bees when I was a teenager, but since I've been photographing them all the time, they don't seem to bother me anymore. <laughs> um, but uh, this is called macro photography. I used a macro lens with a, a, a standard DSLR camera. And it just takes a lot of time and patience to do that more than anything. So um, bee, insects are my popularity. Go on, Sarah. I think there's a flower here or something. Mm -hmm. Move to the next slide. Okay, this is the other side of the coin. I, I take a lot of flower photography. Um, I'm getting better and better at it. I've taken some, but I've taken some courses on flower photography. So <clears throat> it's, it's the lighting. The nice thing about flower photography, the best time to take pictures of flowers when it's cloudy, because one thing you don't want to have is a bunch of shadows all over the place. Uh, if it isn't cloudy, if you bring some kind of a light reflector or some kind of big, huge canvas square, you can block the sunlight and take these kind of photographs. Um, now, this one actually has some sunlight on it here, but uh, a simple DSLR camera, getting really close to it. And I have to tell you, the phone cameras are getting really smart out there. You can get really good pictures with a phone camera. The only thing they don't do is they don't save a raw photo. So they, they save everything in what's called a JPEG. So you can't really modify the exposure too much, but um, but some of the camera phones out there are, I, I can see why the, the point and shoots in the stores have kind of disappeared. <laughs> they They've just, been replaced by your phone. They just yeah. don't have popularity anymore. But the DSLR camera does have some functionality and availability. It has, um, more and more resolution. And uh, so they have greater megapixel cameras. Now, what, I'll, I'll give you something about megapixel right quickly. The reason they talk about really high megapixels is because they wanna sell the camera. Unless you're gonna make a 16 foot poster on your wall, <laughs> almost any phone camera that you have today can make a nice easily 16 by 20 print and look just as good as anything else. So, <laughs> So if you wanna save some money and not get the 50, 60 megapixel camera, you probably can get away with that. <clears throat> um, so anyways, um, lighting's important. Uh, I use a tripod a lot with this kind of stuff. And this, wow. so, and you, you, sometimes you have to bounce around the place and try to find things. We were on our way to um, uh, Roper Lake State Park, which is a cute little place um, near uh, Mount Graham area. Uh, or Safford actually. And I actually walked through the flowers here to keep, try to get the picture of this particular cactus with these flowers and the, and the mountain back there. This was back in 2019 actually. And if you remember all the millions of flowers back then, yes. um, that, that was, uh, that's when this was actually taken. So, and by the way, uh, I noticed driving up to Kid Peak with all this rain we're getting, there's a lot of flowers popping out right now. I saw the poppies all over the place the other day. Uh oh, we're gonna have a whole bunch of people uh, out taking so, photos. Uh, I might start walk taking little walks, stuff away from uh, out about even in your backyard. You could find these things really. So, um, let's see what else. Uh, trying to think what else. Does anybody have any? Questions. I don't see the chat window, so I can. Oh, Dave, can you window. see? Are there questions in the chat? Yes. Oh, oh, yeah. What impact is the gradual degradation of the dark skies in Tucson area having on operations at Kid Peak? 
This is from John Holdren. Okay, so basically, um, it's interesting. You know, it's kind of interesting. I I, I did that. Uh, the, the light pollution is definitely growing. And actually, back in August 2019, they asked me to do another update on the light pollution pictures that were taken many years ago, and they'd been doing that every 10, 15 years, and I just updated it. And if you look at the comparisons, and this is at the visitor center, uh, eventually, when you get up there, um, you can actually see how much the light pollution is growing. The light pollution on astronaut telescopes, what they, what they had to do was they had to start using filters. Again, like I said earlier, when you have something like near Mount Palomar, where you have San Diego that's blazing as many lights and high sodium as they can, that's extremely difficult to filter out because there's a lot more to it. Um, with the low sodium lights and that's um, low sodium, it's easier to filter. Now I'll tell you what's wrong with the low sodium lights. When you go buy a car, the car looks ugly. So, so <laughs> that's the problem with so low sodium lights. Um, but even that, if you have a so low sodium light and you have 50 billion of them, okay, <laughs> you still have an issue. So what they're gonna, what they can do is they can filter out a lot of that light. Um, the digital photography uh, that's coming out, CCD was on a long time ago. The light, the cameras are more sensitive. The light is, uh, we don't have to shoot as long. So we're able to block the light somewhat that way. Um, there are tricks in post-processing to help get that out as well. Um, but I tell you where the light pollution is the biggest problem is when you turn, it's when astronomers take a long series of pictures. So they start at 10 o'clock at night and then they end at two o'clock in the morning, let's say. Well, the sky brightness varies a little bit. That introduces something called gradient. And that's kind of hard to dig out of there. Um, so again, post-processing actually helps remove a lot of that. But uh, fortunately, they're not taking really pretty pictures up there. They're doing more scientific work. So they're actually focusing on, on like an uh, uh, exoplanet or deep looking deep into the Crab Nebula, which has a pulsar in it. Uh, so Kit Peak's probably handling OK right now. And it probably will be OK for a little while. The sky, the sky is actually pretty dark. We have a we have something called a sky quality meter, and if I if I went to Tucson, uh, well, let's say I can't think of a place right now, but um, a park there, and pointed in the sky, so it's, the light meter reading would be about 17 and a half, 18. On top of Quick Camp Peak, it's in the upper upper 21, sometimes the low 22s. And a really, really dark sky, like in the middle of the ocean, would probably be about 22 and a half, 23. So it's, it, it's, um, it's, they need to stay away from the east as much. They probably stay away from the east side of the sky because that's where Tucson's illuminating right now. But once you get about 30 degrees up, it's actually not that bad. So 30, 40 degrees. Dean, I, I have a question for you that's kind of a snowball, but, uh, I really love looking at your photos on your Instagram, and I and I notice the the spectrum, the range. Thinking, hey, here's an artist who loves capturing distant planets and stars, and as well, hyper focusing on the very tiny uh, wonders of our world. And I'm wondering, this has to make you you have to be a bit philosophical. So, what are you what are your thoughts? Well, you mean in the fact that I'm not uploading a lot of astronomical photos? Or? No, I, I'm talking about the span of what you of the beauty that you capture, all the way from uh, the vast cosmos itself, all the way down to the very tiny <laughs> bumblebee. Okay, well, it's interesting. Um, so the doing, I tell you, the Milky Way photography is really inspiring because it's it shows an open vast wilderness into the space, into space. And when you look into taking close up photos like the Crab Nebula and stuff, these are tiny itty bitty things that no one ever sees. 
kind of like a hidden world. You almost need it. You don't even know they're there hmm. taking the telescope. Now, interesting enough, on the other side of the coin, with the nature photography, I used to do landscapes and things like that, but I started going into kind of the hidden world a little bit, taking photographs. I mean, I don't know how many people know a bee had a tongue. <laughs> and so I've been focusing things on that, and it's quite interesting. And not and it you see you say the actual photograph. What I see while I'm photographing, because I have to take the series, my camera has to shoot multiple exposures at 10, 15 frames per second. And I'm actually seeing little itty bitty things, you know, like we, we brush our hair, we, you know, we do this. A bee, for example, he'll brush his little antenna, he'll take the pollen off the head, stupid little things like that. It's quite interesting to watch them. So it's kind of like, just like the Crab Nebula in the galaxy, it's something not everybody sees, but here you got this little tiny insect that's barely visible, and, and you, you don't give it two cents of a thought, and it, it has all kinds of, you know, fur, it's got the hair, and how it uses it, and it's quite clever, actually, how it all put together. I, I think we had a question, or, well, it looks like uh, Naomi Green has a question. Can you unmute yourself? Right. How's that? That sounds good. Okay. Yeah, um, I, I, I don't really have a question. I, I just wanted to see if Sarah could let us uh, flip through his pictures while he answered questions. Oh, yeah. Are you okay with that already? Sure. <laughs> yeah. Well, good, because I have lots of questions. <laughs> the yeah. My Instagram account actually has the most latest and updated photographs. I've been posting in there than more than my website. Although I'm, re I'm rebuilding a website now. So I do, I've been a programmer for like 50, 40 years, 30 years. So website stuff is pretty much second nature to me. Uh, do, do you remember your first telescope and uh, what hooked you on astronomy? And was this when you were a kid or older? Yeah, actually, interesting enough, my dad brought home a telescope because I, I started reading about astronomy when I was in the second grade because I had, there were no books on dinosaurs anymore. So I said, okay, let's read about the sun. <laughs> um, and he brought home a telescope in 1969 for me to look at Saturn. Of course, I looked at Saturn. What do you think happened? Um, so in, on my 12th birthday, I got my first telescope. But after looking through a telescope, you know, you can't, you know, you see the pictures in the book and they look great, but you look yeah. at a telescope, you're not seeing that. So my friend in 1972 says, well, you got to take pictures. Okay, no problem. So I started taking pictures in 1972, mostly on a tripod and on a simple little film camera, a 35 millimeter fan for about 20 seconds. And I saw more with that 20 seconds in the picture than I could even begin to see with my eyes. So Interesting. That, that's kind of what started me into photography. Huh. So uh, we have another question uh, from Peggy Hughes. She's asking if a West Side Astronomy B and B is still open. And with that question in mind, are there spots around Southern Arizona where those of us who are astronomy junkies can uh, go and, and enjoy a B and B? We were talking before you had joined Dean about where we had met in Benson. Yeah, right. Um, yeah. Yeah, and so that unfortunately has closed. Um, but are there any other places that kind of, I mean, other than Kit Peak, offer a viewing experience? So I believe it's if it's still there, and I forgot exactly what it's called, but it's in, it's in southeast Arizona. What's it called? The Astronomy Village. Um, it's about 30, 40 miles north of Douglas in that vicinity in the Cherokee Mountains. Wow. And I believe it's still there. Um, there are places that do that that are out of state. New Mexico Skies used to do it, but I don't think they do that anymore. Uh, so so how does one, you know, begin to get into astronomy? There's an interest, you know, but it seems kind of overwhelming and expensive. So what would you kind of recommend to someone that has an interest how to get into it further? Well, you can actually get a very simple telescope for a few hundred dollars. It's called a daub, and you can get like an eight inch for maybe $500 or something. 
Um, but before you even go that far, I would go to a local planetarium or Kitt Peak when it's open. Um, uh, Low Observatory ha is now doing programs up there. Um, it's can, limited. Can I interrupt you? Is everyone seeing the pictures that I'm showing? Because I'm getting a message from someone that it's completely black. Oh, well, I don't, I see you. <laughs> okay, but, bef but before when I was showing them. Oh, okay. I see some, yeah, it looks like you have to click a play button. Okay, I, I just wanted to make sure I'm seeing thumbs up. I wanted to make sure I wasn't just showing a black screen to everyone. <laughs> Go ahead, Dean, sorry to interrupt. So, uh, so I don't know how, I don't know if most of you are from the Tucson area or just kind of all over the planet, but um, I believe uh, Star Arizona still opens Friday night and Saturday night, one of those two nights. And they set up telescopes that you can kind of look through kind of get a feel of it a little bit. Um, so that's one place local in Tucson I know of. And I believe they still do that. You'd have to contact them and ask them. It's called Star Arizona, you know, to ST and then Arizona. Um, and, uh, but uh, that's, I have to tell you, that's one thing Kit Peak was really proud of. And I know we're gonna get back into that world again because people would come up there and it would it would be a family event people were people plan this thing six seven months in advance from other countries actually just to fly out here and spend the three or four hours at kip peak because it's it's a national observatory in it and we really had it we have an excellent we still do have an excellent program it's still all more or less the same so um i i hope that to see that come back to life here soon I think there are like sometimes the uh, what is the um, I think it's like the astronomy club or what is okay. it club? Yeah, there's a Tucson Amateur Astronomy Club in Tucson, and if you're not in Tucson right now, your city will have a local one. Um, same with the planetariums. Uh, Tucson's got a planetarium, uh, but I know planetariums all over the country. Uh, Jupiter and Saturn are coming in prime viewing. I have a feeling they're gonna, you're gonna start seeing some programs there. Uh, the the country's kind of quieted down with the COVID stuff a little bit. So you can, you, they're gonna, you're gonna be able to start viewing through these things again. Uh, once you see Saturn, people, people at Kitt Peak still say we have a painting on the telescope. That's not real because the planet looks so unbelievable. I would agree with that. The first time that I saw Saturn through a telescope, it does. It looks like somebody put a sticker on the end of the telescope in Europe because it just it it looks like it has to be fake. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. We we have a we have a question for you, Dean. This is from Al. Has the recent haze from West Coast fires affected the visibility for Kitt Peak astronomers? So that's almost worse than the light pollution, actually. Uh, yeah, but so what that's going to do is it filters the sky. So if something was visible before, it's no longer visible now. Um, and there, there, there's actually probably, you know, we're getting rain and everything, but there's, there's still smoke in the sky. I mean, the California fires are way too intense. They're covering the entire United States practically right now. Uh, but yeah, a couple months ago, about a month or so ago, we had so much smoke, you could barely see the sun. So you can imagine what they're trying to do at night. Uh, they probably were not having much luck. Dean, we have a uh, suggestion uh, from one of our guests, Mike, that if you're interested, uh, look into the Tucson Amateur Astronomy Association. Yeah, that's the, that's the club I was mentioning before. Yeah, I was actually a member of that club. I just haven't been for a while, so. I do think uh, but that, they, they... that they meet. They meet at the U U University of Arizona, or that's where they did meet. I'm not sure what the status is now, after everything happened in 2020, but I know they're still around, and they do have um, they do have a dark sky. So if you have a telescope and you become a member, you can drive down there. It's about a 90 minute drive down to the south uh, southeastern part of the Arizona. They got a very extremely complex uh, place there uh, with domes. Uh, you could park your RV there, just all that kind of stuff. So, 
And I think from time to time, they also will go out to, you know, like Saguaro National Park or Karchner Caverns and have kind of events that are open to the public to where you could kind of come view whatever they're showing on their telescope. Yeah, and I actually saw more of that in the past being advertised in the media and stuff. I don't see it lately. Um, uh, but usually, you know, when they said, what are you going to do the, for the weekend? And they would mention a couple of things and said, oh, yeah, the Astronomy T Tucson Astronomy Club, they're going to be setting up at Saguaro National Park. Uh, go and take a peeky. Um, so uh, that was very common. Uh, Debbie Golden made a statement in the chat. She said, I saw the Milky Way for the first time on Kitt Peak after leaving the big telescope. It's quite impressive, actually. Um, it's it's um, the summer Milky Way is much stronger than the winter Milky Way, just because of the, way, because of the position we are in the galaxy. But um, even the, when the winter Milky Way is it, still pretty impressive. Uh, some people will come up there and don't even care about looking through the telescope. The only reason they came up there is they want to sit outside and sit on a chair and just stare at the Milky Way. And with a binocular, it's quite amazing. What you do is in the summer Milky Way, you start at the bottom near the south and you get some uh, seven by 50 binoculars and you can even get a little star chart and just slowly meander up the Milky Way. You're going to see all kinds of open clusters you'll see little globular clusters, which are condensed star clusters. And what looks like a little fuzzy cloud is the Milky Way. Uh, in, in a constellation called Sagittarius, there's something called a star cloud. And it's just right above the teapot, actually. And it looks like a, it looks like a little tiny cloud. So it's kind of, it's kind of impressive. But if you just, if you, you gotta be dark adapted, that's one kit catch. Don't come out of a really bright room and start looking. Sit outside for about 20, 30 minutes because it takes the chemistry for us to convert so we become dark sensitive. And then you want to keep lights low. You know, use a red light. That that that's the red light is least sensitive to our eyes. So if you just use a red light to move around, you can keep pretty dark adapted. Uh, and that's a uh, that that makes viewing the Milky Way is you get a get some chairs, get some coffee or hot chocolate and just spend the time out there, a blanket if it's cold. And we do, I, have, I, a me we do have a meteor shower coming up, by the way, in August. I don't know if it would be clear or not, but um, this, year it's, it, this year it's actually an excellent uh, position. It's August 14th on the night of August. It's the evening of the 13th to the 14th. It's called the Perseid meteor shower. It's one of the strongest meteor showers out there. And it's going to be about new moon when that happens. So um, that uh, you will see, you can see anywhere from 60 to 120 meteors per minute. The shower varies every year, but you'll take, you get those binoculars, well, not binoculars, but get a nice chair and get out there about maybe 12 midnight. And it starts peaking around two o'clock. And the reason it does that is because as we orbit, as we turn, we get more in a directional path on how these meteors come in. Uh, some are fireballs. They look like big, huge, huge things going across the sky. And some are very small and tiny, but it's actually one of the most impressive showers out there. The next one is the Geminids in December. So those two are the strongest. Um, so that's, thanks for mentioning about the Milky Way. It just made me think about the meteor shower. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> Dean, speaking of that kind of phenomenon, in your lifetime of watching the heavens, have you uh, witnessed or seen any changes in uh, any of the heavenly bodies in the night skies, supernovas, that kind of thing? Well, I, I have seen a supernova. I didn't, I've never discovered one, but I photographed one for an astronomer he needed because he discovered it. Huh. Um, yeah, he was an amateur astronomer. And... Um, I've seen great comets come and go. Uh, those are very impressive. Whenever a really bright comet comes up to the sky. Is one approaching? I think there's one up there, but it's not terribly bright. Um, and the main thing um, I've noticed more than time, you know, actually, you know, someone brought up the light pollution. What I saw the most 
I went to play, I was, I was raised in California. I lived there most, a good part of my life. So we used to go places like Mount Palomar in the desert. And it was really, really dark. And you can, you can like, for example, in the desert, we went to Anza Borrego State Park and you, you could not even see the ground practically. Right now, you can kind of read a book now because so much light pollution from San Diego and all that has really grown. So wow. the sky has really deteriorated quite a bit. Matter of fact, uh, it, all you have to go is about 10 miles outside of Tucson and you got pretty much the same sky. Uh, so it's, uh, and that was a two hour drive. So. Uh, I, I want to digress here and give some, uh, uh, a shout out to uh, Tim Hunter, who's with us. Uh, he has a column we feature in the star about the night sky, which uh, I, I follow. Uh, and <laughs> I have the, uh, I have the scientific mind of a toddler, <laughs> but uh, I must say, Mr. Hunter, I, I, I enjoy your column. And uh, Dean, your photographs are <laughs> remarkable. They're just awesome. Uh, yeah. One, one more. Thanks. Appreciate it. So those, I just changed my website. So if you, you guys want to go to the website and right click and save images and send them to printers, I don't care. I, I'm not a credit type of person. <laughs> so, uh, so I just enabled that so people can actually right click on it. One more thing I need to mention that I kind of forgot to say, and I, I do want to say it. Kit Peak is located on the Tana Anam Nation. Um, I encourage you to go search that in Google and check out their website and look at the culture and the history of the nation because it is, Kit Peak is on that property. And we also, when the gift shop was open, we had a lot of beautiful artwork that they had made that was being sold at, at the visitor center. So it's quite amazing. It's, it's in a quite amazing culture and very interesting. And I forgot to copy and paste the website on my notepad. So, but you can all, you just Google it, Totem Autumn Nation. And um, I believe there might be a link even on the Visit Kit P website. And if there isn't, I'm going to put one there. Uh, 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 but I would definitely check that out. Um, yeah, their history is amazing. Thank you for bringing that up. It's, um, yeah, they're big in our history here in Arizona. So we are winding down on our time. So any last thoughts before I kind of introduce what next week's guest is going to be, Dean? Absolutely. That's my uh, Instagram link over there. Perfect. And, um, and, and I had also show, I had shared that earlier as well, but also your website um, link as well. Um, yeah, and on my website, if, if it's not there, it's sharpless, my email, sharpless281 at gmail. I'm always open to op op asking, answering questions. How do you take a photograph of a bee? How do you take the photograph of a Milky Way? What's the best thing to look in the sky right now? I mean, I, uh, I reply to those very well. And uh, I'm going to expand my YouTube. I have a YouTube channel there, but it's mostly about how to use the astronomical software. I'm going to expand that quite a bit about how to take pictures of flowers, how to take pictures of bees, how to take pictures of the Milky Way, things like that. So you can um, you can always you can link into my YouTube if you want, and uh, I will be posting new videos up there for sure. Well, that's an invaluable resource. I know when people are starting out in some of these, I hate to even say hobby because it's just like these people are they become professionals, you know, just like with, you know, when they say amateur astronomers, I'm like, I feel like the word amateur shouldn't be there because they're so knowledgeable of the night sky. They seem uh, way beyond an amateur, but we thank you so much for you taking time out of your busy schedule, especially with something going on with work that you were having to deal with. Um, so we. One more thing, Sarah, can you email me the recorded video because I told everybody to start at three o'clock so they're not gonna get to watch it oh no <laughs> yes I will definitely give me a few hours and I'll email that sure. video when it is done but thank you again for your time and for sharing your beautiful artistic works they're just amazing to look at absolutely um, and I'm really glad you're doing what you're doing once a week here it's quite a, quite very very good
Yeah, thank you, Dean. Sarah, who do we have uh, next week? Yes. So next week, I mean, this is beyond my knowledge. So Christopher Castro is a U of A professor of hydrology and atmospheric sciences. So Castro researches climate in North America using regional atmosphere modeling and his projects engage the operational weather forecast community and water resources in the Southwest. So water is such a hot topic for us right now. Um, he was actually recommended by one of our regular um, attendees. Um, she attended, a, I think a seminar by him and just said it was absolutely fascinating what he had to say about water. Um, so we look forward to having him. We also have a really nice roster of upcoming guests in the next few months. So keep an eye out on tucson.com slash opinion. And we kind of put up on there who's going to be coming. Um, but we appreciate all of you taking time out of your busy schedules to be here. Thank you again, Dean. Fitz yeah, and I welcome. thank you all. And we will see you next week. Everybody have a great day. Yes.